I want to begin tonight to thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this lectureship, especially the title of tonight's subject matter on social drinking. Alcohol has definitely plagued those in my family as I look upon uh, this subject matter. I remember when I was 10 years old that I watched my uncle who was so drunk that he crawled from the living room to the kitchen to get another beer. My oldest brother is an alcoholic. I also had an uncle who was on methadone for 25 years, and we look at that word metha, and we're going to look at that later on this evening. But he also uh, had an alcohol problem and then, at the age of 49, overdosed. But when you think of this word, Titor, we, many would look at that as an insult, but is it? When you look at the word and you define it where it means that I am going to be completely abstaining from intoxicating drink. We have another passage that kind of goes along with that. In the book of Romans, please, in Romans chapter 12, we find that Paul says in verse 9, he says, Let love be without hypocrisy. But then he also says, abhor what is what? What is evil? And we find that evil ought to be disgusting to us. But the concept of abhor means that we ought to stay as far away from it as possible. Not that we're going to toe the line when it comes to sin. You know, as we live in this society today, we find that many have been affected by this concept of alcohol. As many have been affected especially here in America. It is one drug that has many hooked, as you see the image on the screen. And we find that even the, the, the beer advertisements, they glorify this pleasurable side of drinking alcohol. But you know, they never show, what's interesting, they never show the deaths that take apart. They never show the pain and the suffering uh, that is composed uh, with this powerful liquid. And it's no wonder why we find that Paul uh, would instruct us to abhor what is evil. Instead, we find that they will come out with ads that will say, drink responsibly. And we also find that they'll come out with other ads that says, friends, know when to say when. And we find it is pure hypocrisy. But as we look at this concept of alcohol, there is a caution for concern. We find that most everyone has been affected by alcohol. We find the church has been deeply affected by uh, drugs and alcohol addiction. We find that many come from families which have these problems. Uh, many have been affected in some way, in some shape. And we also find that there are many within the church, churches today, that hide these problems within their lives. And so there is a caution for concern. When you look at alcohol, please, it is responsible for... 40% of all auto fatalities and 80% of all home violence, 30% of all suicides, and 60% of all child abuse, and even 65% of a person drowning. And when you look at the overall statistics, please, and this number jumps year by year, I did read in 2012 where there was over 80% of people in this country drank. But in 2014, it was around 70% of this country. 18 years or older where there's someone that has tasted or have been a, a victim of drinking alcohol. And we find that over 40 million are known as alcoholics, please. But as we consider tonight, we need to understand that alcohol is nearly as old as mankind. And we find that drinking and drunkenness is not a new problem but it has always been around, even, ladies and gentlemen, in the book of Ecclesiastes, we find that even Solomon says there is nothing new under the sun. And we find in the book of Genesis, please, in chapter 9, in verse 20 through 23, if you, don't, if you turn there with me, please, that we, we follow that, that even Noah fell victim to the effect of alcohol. In the book of, of Genesis chapter 9, please, we read, and now Noah began to be, uh, 
uh, began to be a farmer and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his what? In his tent. And so as you look at what happened to Noah, we find that what? Uh, that his nakedness was exposed. And so even a righteous man becoming drunk and lay naked in his tent. This, uh, this good man had his sense of right and wrong dulled by the evil effects of drinking alcohol. And we're going to concentrate on that later on this evening. Another place is in Lot. In the book of Genesis chapter 19, please. We know the story of in Genesis chapter 19. Where we find his two daughters as God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And we find that they were told to exit the city and not look back. And we find that his wife did and turned to a pillar of salt. And we find that Lot flew, uh, fled to the mountains. And what took place after that? As we look, please, at the very end of this. Verse 35, then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger rose and lay, with, and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down, and he arose. And so thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. And so as you look at Lot as another example, please, what happened to him? We find that his two daughters committed fornication with him. Lot, who was overcome by the evil effects of alcohol. While drunk, he had sexual relations with his own daughters. And as you look, please, when you look at these two examples, would this have occurred if Noah had never gotten drunk? Would this happen to Lot if he would have been sober? Think about that this evening. But as we consider alcohol, we need to understand that all, uh, we all know that drunkenness is a sin, and even those today in our society that have a little bit of Bible knowledge will tell you, well, the Bible only condemns drunkenness. And everyone knows that, but we find that many will say, well, what about social drinking in moderation and what we call recreational drinking? What about responsible drinking, preacher? What about the occasional beer and wine? We find that many, ladies and gentlemen, will say, the Bible does not say, thou shall not drink alcohol. And so based upon that principle, we find that many want to justify an action based solely upon this premise. Because we do not have a thus, uh, uh, thou shall not. And so we find, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible gives principles to condemn this action. But think about that. What about social drinking, please? I want to read to you just for a few moments of your time as we begin this lesson of a man that was caught in the consumption of alcohol, what it did to his life, and but what he saw. Because we find that there are many defenders, unfortunately. And we find that there are even some brethren that defend the modern of drinking. He says this, please. He said, it was the most com compelling argument I've ever heard about social drinking. A young man in his 30s stood in front of the the leaving the uh, pit conference in Indianapolis on Saturday and told his story. His alcohol was began, uh, use began in high school and intensified uh, in college. And so that's something we're going to talk about tonight. One doesn't wake up one day and all of a sudden they're an alcoholic. There is a process when you look at drinking alcohol. And here's a man that relates to that when he says that uh, his alcohol use began in high school and it intensified in college. He hit it well. He was drinking heavily even though he was actively involved in church activities. Knowledge was not my problem. Connecting my heart to my head was my problem. He shrugged off his first DUI and he sat in a jail cell following his second DUI. He looked around at other prisoners a decade his senior and asked, is this where I want to be in 10 years? And he said this was decision time. He continues on, please. Today, he is 10 years sober, married, and we also find that he is a father, please. And he told his powerful story. The silence was deafening. And then he said, I go to an AA meeting where people confess their struggles and where it is acknowledged openly that we cannot place ourselves in any situation 
where we could be tempted to drink. And then I sit in a Bible class, and this is a church of Christ. I sit in a Bible class and hear a brother in Christ make a comment that he doesn't see anything wrong with social drinking. And I just shake my head. Sadly, alcohol is the leading drug of choice for many. Make no mistake, it is a drug. Its force is powerful, addictive, and life-changing. And someone dares encourage its recreational use. There was another incident that happened on Facebook that, that someone had given me some material, and it was members of the church that was basically condoning the, the modernation of drinking alcohol. And the young man there would go to Galatians, 9, uh, Galatians 5 and verse 21 where Paul is condemning drunkenness and say, see, Paul is not drink, uh, condemning it in moderation but in excess. And that is kind of the mindset and the attitude that we find even among our own brethren. You expect that from the general public of our society, even among some religious groups. But Bible seekers and those that are Bible thinkers, you would hope that they would know better. And so what about social drinking? Does the Bible ever condemn drinking alcohol beverages? And I ask you tonight, if you open your Bible to as we go to God's Word. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, please. Because I believe that Peter is truly condemning the modern nation of alcohol beverage. He is condemning social drinking. As you look at 1 Peter, please, chapter 4, I'll read all the text. It says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, he says, Arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has what? Has ceased from sin. And verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh, for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, reveries, drinking parties, and he says abominable idolatries. As you look at Peter, please, we find that he is making a contrast of the former life of the Gentile Christians with their new life in Christ. And we find in their former life they live to what? Uh, to please their, the flesh. But in the new life, they were called to what? Suffer in the flesh and to live in the spirit. And we find that the particular sins that Peter lists, lewdness, or you might have the word lasciviousness, we find lust, drunkenness, reveries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries represent sins that are associated with pagan lifestyle. Now to be fair with the context, Peter's writing to those, those Gentiles at the time that, that would worship the God of wine. But when you look at this, please, we find something very interesting. We find banqueting. According to the original King James Version that's used there. And we understand the concept. If you look at Peter, he describes three different levels he may, of alcohol consumption. And we find that Peter is making a distinction between them. And he notice he mentions there, please. In verse 3, he talks about that drunkenness. That's one that is what? That is going for the excess of wine. We understand that concept. And many would say, well, preacher, that's what Peter's condemning. But notice, please, also, he mentions there reveries. Now, reveries, you know, and unfortunately, I live in Louisiana where they celebrate Mardi Gras. And it is a time of year where we find that the revelers are out. My wife and I watch the news during this time. And the newscasters will say the revelers are out. They're out drinking alcohol in the streets. But I want you to notice another word that's used there. My translation says, notice, drinking parties. And we find, please, that the drinking bout, the banquet, according to Trench, please. He describes it, ladies and gentlemen, when you look at this word banqueting, uh, notice he says, not of necessity excessive. In other words, it's not entirely speaking of one that is a drunk. And so we find that Peter is making a distinction uh, between these. We also find that he makes a further 
Note of apotos, the up, another Greek word, please, is related to words of excess in that it gives opportunity for excess. Well, that's, there's no doubt. When a person starts drinking alcohol, there is an opportunity for that, for, to extend that to be what? To be drunk. But notice he also says, then, it is the cocktail party drinking, sipping the wine, having a few drinks with the boys, and notice social drinking that's involved in well. And so you find here in 1 Peter chapter 4 that drinking is condemned on, on every level. And we find that Peter makes a distinction of all of them. Every kind of drinking, I believe, fits into one of these categories as he condemns the excess of wine, the revelers are reveling, and then the banquets. And we find that he made a specific reference to three levels of drinking and notice that they are all condemned. Brother J.D. Tant was asked this question, please. Is it all right to drink a little just to be social with my friends? His reply was this. I suppose it is no more sin to drink a little than it would be to steal a little, to lie a little, to whip your wife a little, or even kill a man a little. And we understand the concept there. J.D. Tan was, he, he was very boisterous in his preaching, but he makes an excellent point. We understand that we cannot lie a little. We know Revelation 21 and verse 18 says all liars will have their part in the lake of fire which burns with brimstone. And we understand that concept, please. And we know that we cannot steal. And so here's the question. If we can't lie a little, if we can't steal a little. And we know that we can't abuse our wives, but can we banquet a little? No, ladies and gentlemen. That's the point of emphasis is made. We also find, as we look at what does the Bible, does the Bible condemn, we also find in the Old Testament, please, Solomon. In Solomon, please, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 1, we're going to look at both of these. In Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1, we find that he says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it, he says, is what? He says, is not wise. But we also find, if you go over to, to, to chapter 23, I'm going to put both of these passages together. We find in chapter 23, beginning in verse 29, he says, who, is, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has contentions, who has complaints, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes? How about those who linger long at the wine? Those who go in search for mixed drink. But notice, verse 31 is the point of emphasis we need to be made, that needs to be made. He said, do not look on the wine when it's red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. But notice verse 32, at the last, it bites like a viper. You might have the word serpent. And stings, he says, like a viper. He says, your eyes will see strange things. Your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of a mast saying, huh, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I wake? And then I may seek, he says, another, another wine. So we find, please, first of all, that many want to focus on the latter half back at chapter 20, the latter half of this concept, please, and think anything less than intoxication is not spoken against. But I want you to notice in Proverbs 20 where we find that Solomon, please, addresses the verse and he speaks of all three, wine, strong drink, and intoxication. And you might say, well, preacher, I don't see that. Notice, wine is a mocker. There's one. Strong drink is a brawler. But where do you see the intoxication? He says, whoever is led astray by it. So even Solomon here recognizes all three of these, wine, strong drink, and intoxication. And the, and the thrust of the matter is that Solomon is condemning all three of them. In Proverbs 23, please, and there's no doubt that you look back at that passage, I want to make some distinctive points. 
that one can look at verse 33 and 35 and clearly and can clearly see the addictive nature of alcohol. We're not going to argue that this evening. But there is a hidden danger that many do not see or may refuse to see. One might say, but I can handle my alcohol, preacher. Yet the warning is there and is always an afterward. Now what you think of the word afterward. Because what a lot of people fail to realize is that once you start drinking alcohol, and you say, well, I'll stop it for, the alcohol continues to what? Process in your body even after you stop it for. And I don't think many realize that. The problem with social drinking and, and them trying to stop of drunkenness is that the alcohol keeps working one even after he stops drinking. But we find, please, that Solomon is trying to get us to see the hidden danger that lies in alcohol consumption and its effect and influence. Notice in chapter 20 he says, here's the effect of alcohol. He says, wine is a mocker. That's right. There's the influence and the effect of what alcohol does. He also says that, that strong drink is a brawler. That's right. There is the effect of alcohol. He also says that here's the intoxication that's involved in those that drink alcohol. He says, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. Now you go over back to chapter 23. And I want you to notice, he says. Notice what Solomon is trying to get us to see, the hidden danger. He says, do not look on the wine when it's red. When it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around, he says smoothly. You know, you look at wine in a glass and you swirl, it looks real nice and red. It sparkles. And notice, some people like to smell it, say it smells good. It's attractive. But notice what he says. When it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around, he says what? Smoothly. What's the hidden danger? The hidden danger, ladies and gentlemen, in drinking alcohol is verse 32. It bites, or excuse me, at last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. And Solomon said, don't pay attention to what it looks like. Don't pay attention to what it tastes like. But it, it's the influence and the effect of wine, strong drink. That's the hidden danger. Many don't see that. You don't see that when you look at the cup in your hand. But as soon as you swallow the alcohol, it begins to affect your body. You're under its influence. And so that's the hidden danger that lies in alcohol consumption, its effect and its influence. And that's what Solomon is trying to get us to see and understand. We also find, how would you handle a poison snake? How would you handle a poison snake? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I wouldn't handle it at all. And so like, like Solomon says, don't look at the wine when it's in the cup. In other words, stay away from it. Just like everyone would stay away from a poisonous snake. No one is going to reach their hand down there and grab a poisonous snake because of its sting, because of its bite, because its venom is so potent. And so how should we handle alcohol? I'm going to handle it like a teetotaler. I'm not going to go around it. That's how. We also find, what did Paul say? The book of Ephesians, please, chapter 5 and verse 18. Verse 18, we find that Paul says, do not be drunk with wine. You might have the word drunk in there. In which it is dispensation, but he said, be what? Be filled with what? With the Spirit. When you look here, please, we find that the Greek words, and some words that are very important as we define this, Paul says, do not be what? Do not be drunk. The idea to... Begin to be softened. To grow drunk, the idea is marking the beginning of, there's our Greek word, methu. We also get the word methadone, a drug. 
But we also find, please, that it signifies to make drunk, to grow drunk, or to become intoxicated according to, to vines. And we find that there are degrees of drunkenness. And so as you look at Paul's statement here, and you look at the Greek word to begin to be softened, to grow drunk, marking the beginning of the process is what Paul is speaking of. And he says there, please, signifies to make drunk, to grow drunk, or to become intoxicated. See, man will look at Ephesians 5 and say, Paul is condemning drunk, but you look at the Greek words here, and you find that Vine says uh, the concept of to become intoxicated. Do I need to be drunk to become intoxicated? No, you don't. You become intoxicated as soon as you take your first drink. And that's something important. Any individual who seeks to defend social drinking fails to recognize the truth that there are degrees of drunkenness. Must one be stone drunk to be considered drunk? No, ladies and gentlemen. And that's the problem we see uh, among many as there are, there are degrees of drunkenness. And we find, please, that it is a process and that's something that's important. We find that drinking is drunkenness. It's a process. And this includes social or recreational drinking. As there are degrees of drunkenness, and a person begins to be drunk when they begin to what? Begin to drink. For example, if it takes five beers for you to be drunk, then your first beer, you then you're one fifth drunk. If it takes four beers for you to be drunk, then you're one fourth drunk. But it's the beginning process. When a person takes any amount of alcohol beverage, they are softened. There's our Greek word. Uh, they're intoxicated and drunk to that degree. So how can a Christian, someone defend social drinking when, when the very moment that a person takes any amount of alcohol, they are intoxicated. They are drunk to that degree. The effects of alcohol begin with the first drink. Drunkenness is a condition which actually begins with the first drink and progresses further when it is more consumed. We also find that drinking is harmful. Even in, moder even in moderation, please. We find that alcohol is a poison. We find that alcohol is a narcotic, a drop. We also find that alcohol is, has proven to cause brain damage. Irreplaceable, I might add. And we need to understand as a Christian... We are responsible to be good stewards over our bodies. Look at Paul in statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. We find that Paul says, Or do you not know that when your body is, uh, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, which is uh, who is in you, whom you have from God, and he says that you're not your own, that's right. Why? Because your body belongs to God. And so because it belongs to God, we are to be good stewards. And he says, Therefore, he says, you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. He says, which are God's. And so I am going to be a what? A titor. Why? I'm going to glorify God in my body. I'm not going to allow my body uh, to be poisoned by uh, intoxicated drink. I want, to, I want my life and I want to be a good steward over my body to bring, to bring honor and glory to God. And that's what Paul says. He said, you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit. He says, where's your God's? And we need to understand that it is our responsibility in stewardship to take care of our bodies. We damage our body when we drink alcohol. We damage our, our brain cells when we drink alcohol. We destroy those brain cells. We're destroying our bodies. You look at a man that is 40 years old that either is a social drinker or even is one that drinks every day. And you can look upon that individual and you can take another man that's 40 that doesn't drink and you can see a distinction in those individuals. The man that drinks will probably look like he's 50 or 60 years old where the man that doesn't drink doesn't look like he's aged very much. Because alcohol is harmful. It takes a toll on our bodies. And our bodies are to be used to bring honor and glory to God. 
How about arguments? Arguments for justifying recreational drinking, please. And probably one of the most famous passages that we find that many use, if you would open your Bible or turn with me, please, to the book of John, chapter 2, and we find that Jesus turned water into wine. Here that we know that they're at a wedding feast. And so here's the question I have for those in the audience tonight as you consider this. Did Jesus turn water into an alcohol beverage? That's really the question. Because there are many in our society that would say that Jesus turned the, wine, the water into wine and it was an alcohol beverage for them to enjoy at this feast. But let's read on, please. We find, beginning in chapter 2 and verse 1, it said, On the third day, when there was a wedding at Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, then both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when, notice, and when they ran out of wine. That word wine, according to Greek, is onos. That word wine in the Greek is general. General in that you cannot cipher, please, whether it is fermented or unfermented. It's general. But for man to take John 2 and to say that Jesus turned that wine into an alcohol beverage, ladies and gentlemen, is twisting that Greek word, onos. And he said, please, and they ran out of wine. The mother of Jesus said to him, uh, they have no wine. And so Jesus said to the woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come, and Jesus said to his servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there was about six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 to 30 gallons apiece. Would you consider that? Then Jesus said to fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some up out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. Verse 9. Notice the master, please. Something that's important. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. Notice the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man at, at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drank, drunk, excuse me, then the inferior, you have kept the good wine, he says, until now. Let me just say that wine is not always an intoxicating beverage. Second, we need to understand that wine means fruit from the grape. But notice, please. If such is true, then it would mean that Jesus supplied a large quantity of intoxicating wine to people who were already well drunk. A quick calculation shows that Jesus made about 120 to 160 gallons of drink. Think about that, friend. Because we find that those will try to justify this. Consuming this quality, or quantity, excuse me, of liquor would have contributed to a huge drinking party and which clearly we find in 1 Peter 4, we find that it's condemned. And so we need to conclude and we need to make reference that this wine was, un, was not fermented, please. Note that the governor, notice what he says, please. He calls Jesus' drink the best served during the feast. The best wine does not necessarily refer to the beverage, with the greatest alcohol tent, the governor would simply compliment the host of the drink's quality of taste. If you look back, please, in, in, in chapter 2, when we find that he says, and he said to him, every man at the beginning set out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior, he said, you have kept the good wine until now. Think about this, please. Did Jesus turn water into an alcohol beverage? Would Jesus violate his own scripture condemning the, the drinking of alcohol? Was Jesus, and I'm not trying to be crude in the pulpit, was Jesus a bartender? Because go to the Old Testament, please, in the book of Habakkuk. In the 
in the book of Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 15. Notice what it says. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor. Is Jesus violated that scripture? Notice pressing him to your bottle even to make him drunk. Is Jesus being some bartender just handing out uh, alcohol beverage to get all these people drunk? Come on. And notice it says that you may look on his nakedness. And so would Jesus violate his own scripture condemning the, uh, the drinking of alcohol? We also find would Jesus violate his own principle in being a stumbling block? In the Gospel of Matthew, please, chapter 18. Matthew 18, please. What did Jesus say about offenses and being a stumbling block? Beginning in verse 6, he said, But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, was Jesus guilty of sin? It would be better for him, notice, if a millstone were hung around his neck and were drowned in the, in the, uh, in the depth of the sea. Would Jesus violate his own principle? Think about that, brethren. Friend. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man of whom the offenses come. No, Jesus did not violate his own scripture. He was not pressing the, uh, the bottle to his neighbor. No, Jesus didn't violate his own principle of being a stumbling block. For man to twist that and say, well, Jesus turned that into an alcohol beverage. And so therefore, when I am at, when I am at a gathering, that hey, I could drink too. No, you can't. We also find that the New Testament teaches complete control over mind and body, please. Think about that. When we look at our lives as Christians, and we look at social drinking... Does the New Testament teach complete control over mind and body? It does. We find that the Bible commands that I am to be completely in self-control. That means my entire body, all of my thoughts, all of my actions, all of my words. And we find, please, self-control describes the dominion that one has over his thoughts, his words, and his actions. That's right. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, we are to apply self-control to our lives. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6, that's 2 Peter, please, I apologize. 2 Peter 1, 5. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to what? Knowledge to what? Self-control. To self-control, perseverance, to perseverance. He says what? He says godliness. Self-control is a fruit that we must produce in our lives. And we need to understand the consumption of alcohol influences an individual's thoughts his words and his actions, it does. From the very moment, that, very moment that you allow that substance to enter into your body, it's beginning to control your thoughts, your words, and your actions. We also find the Bible commands soberness of mind. And we find that it signifies, please, to be free from all influence of intoxicants, according to vines. If you look at 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, we find that Paul, Peter instructs those. He said, be sober. In verse 8, have self-control, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom, whom he may devour and so as a Christian, I am to always, what, have clear thinking of my thoughts and my actions and the things that I say in my life. It suggests the exercise, that restraint that governs all passions and all desires according to, according to violence, please. And we find that the consumption 
ladies and gentlemen, of alcohol takes away an individual's inhibitions. It takes away those inhibitions. Would you look today in our society, please? Young ladies, they get pregnant because they've committed sexual immorality because of the effect of alcohol. They don't have control of their minds. They don't have control over their, over their actions. It lowers and one loses those inhibitions, even for a social drinker. And we find that Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he speaks of our manner of life, please. And he says, you are all sons of light and sons of day. He said, we are not of the night or of darkness. That's right. He says in verse 6, therefore let us not sleep. As others do, but let us watch and but. There's our word, be sober, self-control. And he says there, please, let us who are of the day be sober, put it on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet. The hope, he says, of salvation. Paul's statement to young men, and I put this in here because it's very important. Even in, in the lives of young men, we find that Paul in Titus, please, chapter 2 and verse 7, he begins in verse 6, he says, Likewise, he thought the young men to be sober-minded. But what's involved in being sober-minded? Notice he says, In all things showing yourself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, but notice reverence and incorruptibility. That speaks of our, our moral character. But notice he says, sound speech that cannot be condemned, please. And so the word sober means to be temperate or abstinence, especially in regards to, to intoxicants. Young men are to have their minds and their passions in control, exercising self-control. The Bible also commands that we'd have sound judgment. Make sound judgment. The Greek word, please, in soundness of mind, sound judgment. Practically expressing the meaning, it is the habit to enter self-government with its constant reign of all passions and desires which would hinder the temptation of these from arising. Go to John 7, please. In John chapter 7, Jesus makes a note about making righteous judgments. Jesus in John 7, please, in verse 24, we find that Jesus says, Do not judge according to appearance, but he says, Judge with what? Judge with righteous judgment. And so we find that the Christian must make righteous judgments all the time. And here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. When a person is involved in drinking alcohol, and that alcohol affects their, their mind, affects their words, affects their actions. They're not able to make those righteous judgments. You find that Paul scribes this type of sound judgment. I'm only using this as a spiritual application, please. In dealing with modest attire, Sobriety, moderation, propriety, shame fastness. In the book of, of 1 Timothy chapter 2 in, in verse 9, where Paul speaks of ladies that are to dress, and likewise also that the women adorn themselves with modest apparel, with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or, pearly, or pearls or costly clothing, but which is per, Proper for women professing godliness in good works. Godliness. Propriety means a sense of shame, a shrinking from trespassing the boundaries of piety, please. Proper reverence. But notice, it's the idea that I'm not going to toe the line. But notice he says, a shrinking from trespassing the boundaries. We also find he, as Apostle Paul speaks of moderation, Sobriety, shame fastness, that's something that is rooted in my character. 
And you know, when you look at all three of these words, I had to be of a sound mind, make sound judgments, and to have self-control of over my entire life. You know, Paul sums it all up. Paul sums up all three of these distinctive points in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11. But Paul says this, please. Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but he, notice he says, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Think about that. I'm not going to be brought under the power of any. I'm going to be a tea tower. I am not going to be brought under the power of alcohol that's going to control my mind, that's going to control my thoughts, that's going to control my actions. Think about that. We also find that Paul told Timothy that he was what? In 1 Timothy 5, please. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23. Some have also used this passage as well in 1 Timothy 5, verse 23, where we find that Paul says, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the stomach's sake. And so since Paul told Timothy that, that he could use a little wine, then I can drink a little wine. Really? If you look at the context, please, there is no biblical proof that this was fermented wine. One has to prove that. And if, once again, if I am not mistaken, the Greek word is onos, which that word wine is used generic. <laughs> but we also find that Paul er, is, is suggesting to young Timothy to what? To drink a little wine for the stomach's sake, for medicinal purposes. And so how can one today justify recreation drinking by using this passage? They would completely be twisting it. Paul didn't tell young Timothy to drink a little wine for recreational use. No, he told him to drink a little wine, medicine that would help him for medicinal purposes. This passage cannot be used to justify social drinking. How about the effect of alcohol, please? The effect. When you look at the concept of intoxication, please, is the process of a psychological change which occurs upon the consumption of drinking alcohol. We've already stated in this passage that as soon as one takes the first drink, they are affected by that alcohol. It is not a state of being, but a process, ladies and gentlemen. When alcohol begins to produce changes in you, you are intoxicated. Alcohol is absorbed and working in the human body within seconds after being swallowed. And matter of fact, the AMA has suggested there is no level of BAC that does not have effect. What do you think, please? Does one drink make a difference? Think about that, please. And I want to go through you very quickly. Does one drink make a difference? One beer equals one 12 ounce beer. A normal size is about a 5% of alcohol level. We also find malt liquor, which is much, has much more, Char uh, ranges from 6.9 alcohol, and so ounces of, of malt liquor is approximately 1.5 drinks. A 40 ounce of malt liquor is four and a half drinks. We also find liquor, one drink of 1.5 ounce of liquor is 40% alcohol or 80 proof. Just one drink. This is how much whiskey, vodka, gin, tequila, brandy is measured in a mixed drink or in a uh, standard size of a shot glass. And remember that the mixed drink may not be measured and often contain far more than 1.5 uh, ounces of alcohol. And, and you know how I know that? Because I used to drink. And when I would go 
the, the little place is shut down, but I used to go to Cherokee and Baytown when I was in my early and mid-20s, and I always drank seven and seven. That's Seagram seven and seven up. And those bartenders, they don't measure out the alcohol. They pour the alcohol in as they pour the, the soda in with it. And so that's a good point here. When you remember that mixed drinks may not be measured and often contain far more than one point ounce uh, of alcohol. Consider that, please. We also find, please, that even wine, one drink, a five ounce of a standard wine equals 12% uh, percent of alcohol. This is most table wines, white, red, or even champagne. And so the question is, please, how much does one drink make a difference? I got this chart, and it's very powerful. But there's another chart after it. And you look at the body weight very quickly. Notice, please, if a man, if a, a, this is a male, this, and it's much stronger for women, but a male that weighs 100 pounds, if they drink one drink, does it make a difference? Notice, please, the alcohol level will be zero. Four, three. Where is that on the scale, please? Zero, four, three. If you look at the, at the up here, you got the 0 0.2 up to 0 0.3, 0 0.5. And if you go above, it's a legal definition of intoxication for people under 21 of age. Notice few obvious effects, slight intensification move. The O5 or to 06, feeling of warmth, relaxation, mild. But notice, please, uh, exaggeration of emotion and behavior, slight decrease in reaction time. And notice in the, even in his muscles, coordination, but even impaired judgment. One drink, two drinks for a 100-pound man is 0.87. That person is considered legally drunk. That's just 100 pounds. Individual. Most men weigh more than that, so if you even take the one down to 150 pounds and you look at two drinks and it's 0 0.058, and it's 0 0.58, that's just two drinks. That's a social drinker, ladies and gentlemen. Their judgment is impaired. I didn't come up with these statistics. These are the, this is the facts. Just two drinks. Two drinks. Three drinks, please. It's 0.87. you imagine if a man drank one 40-ounce malt liquor? That's four and a half drinks. If he had two, that equals to nine beers that this man has already drank. And man, people look at that and say, well, he's not an alcoholic. He's not a drunk. He's only had two drinks. That's right. And his blood alcohol level, look where it is. And so does one drink make a difference? You bet it does. It does. And you know what? I want to be a teetotaler. I want to follow God's wisdom. Because you look at sound judgment, sound mind, soberness, there's we, we find God's wisdom that will keep our minds from being intoxicated by alcohol that would cause us to lose our inhibitions. And so at, as a teetotaler, that's what I want to be because one drink makes a difference. And I don't want to take part in any social drinking of alcohol. And so is it condemned under the authority of Christ? Yes, it is. Do we see biblical principles from the passage that we have looked at that where it's condemned? Yes, it is. But we're not done. We have a few more slides, please. How about scriptural principles very quickly? Violated by, violated by those who drink. And so here's a question. How can they influence others for good? How can we influence others for good if I'm a social drinker? Because a social drinker cannot 
uh, be an influence for good to those who believe. Even Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 5 in verse 13, where he says that we are to be the soul and light of the world. We find that salt uh, rec uh, represents our influence. Light represents our godly example. And as a Christian, I have just set forth a godly influence and a godly example that I would bring honor and glory to God. In verse 60, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God in heaven. And so how can uh, we influence others for good? Because a social drinker cannot influence others for good. How can he convince, we convince the drunkard to lay down his bottle and get sober while at the same time while we have a sip every now and then, we look like a hypocrite. You know, in Paul, in, in Romans chapter 13, I keep looking for a clock and I'm sorry, but there's... But in Romans chapter 13 and verse 14, we find that Paul says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's what others need to see in our lives. I'm a teetotaler. I'm going to completely abstain from, from, from alcohol. I'm going to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul says uh, in the book of Galatians chapter 2 that it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And that's what people need to see in our lives. And if I'm going to, to influence others for good, to become a child of God, then I need to set forth a godly example. And he says, he says, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. That means give it no opportunity How can we tell another to abstain from fleshly lust when you are failing or we are failing to do it in our own life? You know, it would be interesting for me to tell my oldest brother, and I love him dearly, you need to quit drinking while I'm holding a beer in my own hand. He would look at me as a pure hypocrite, and he would call me that to my face. In 1 Peter, please, we find in 1 Peter's chapter 1, and verse 2 and verse 11, 12, we find that Peter says, Beloved, I, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from flesh and the lusts which war against the soul. Does alcohol war against the soul? I bet it does. Having your conduct, notice, honorable, your conversation, honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. You know, a Christian is always under a lens of a microscope. And how can I influence others for good when they see the evil in my own life? They can't, you can't. And so we find that Peter says that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, your manner of life, your influence, which they observe. Watch. Glorify God in the day of visitations. How much is our, your soul worth? Or others worth? Does this, what does this do for your influence for Christ? What if you saw an elder drinking in a bar? What would you think? What would you think of that man that's supposed to be shepherding the flock? That's supposed to be setting forth the godly examples for others to follow. <laughs> but he's at a bar drinking, social drinking. What about a gospel preacher? At a bar drinking alcohol. Four o'clock happy hour. What would you think about that? What kind of influence would he have on your life? What about those in the community that knows he's a gospel preacher? Those in the community that know uh, this individual is an elder? What kind of influence is, are they going to have for good for those around him? See, now you see, the, now you see the importance of God's wisdom. And now you see the importance of being a teetotaler. Where you can always, at all times in your life, influence others for good. Alcohol damages, please. 
and destroys your influence for godliness. It does. Your ability, please. Your ability to effectively help others with soberness and self-control is, is ruined. Because if we don't have self-control in our own lives, how are we going to teach others that they need to practice self-control in their own lives? And do it. Your influence is one which promotes sinful conduct. Think about that. And finally, tonight, the lesson is yours. One who never drinks will never become an alcoholic, number one. Because alcoholic always begin with the first drink. Second, we find we'll never be responsible for the damage of drinking causes to oneself or to others. We will never get drunk. We will never become enslaved to alcohol. That's right. As Paul said in Romans chapter 6, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies that become its slave. We will never influence another to drink. We will never destroy our, our body by drinking. And finally, we'll never hurt the Lord and His church. Think about this. Which one is going to lead someone to Christ? A one that's a social drinker? <laughs> or is it going to be one that's a teetor? I know the answer to that. I want to be a teetor. I want to completely abstain from drinking alcohol. I want to set forth a godly example to my family, to my fellow brethren, to the community, to the world. I want my light to shine. Think about that this evening. Take out your song books, please, and over to the song that's been selected for the invitation. You see a lot of God's wisdom in a, in a lesson like this. It makes you wonder what our society would be like today if it followed the wisdom we find. And so as we look at Colossians 3.17, whenever you do a word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Is social drinking permissive under the authority of Christ? No, ladies and gentlemen, it's not. I've given you the passages. Study them. Does under the authority of Christ condemn drunkenness, revelries, banqueting, social drinking? It does. It does. And so I want to be a teetor. Tonight, as you consider your life, if there's someone here that's not a child of God, would you consider examining your soul and realizing your sin has separated you from God and realize what Jesus has done for you? Jesus came to this earth. He died on the cross for your sins. He has given man the gospel to spread, to preach. That for those who could have their hearts pricked, that they would see the need to obey the gospel. Do you see the need tonight? I hope so. We, we see God's love in the gospel. We see Jesus sacrifice his blood. And tonight you can come in contact with that through obedience to the gospel. Whether it be one that would be willing to step out on the aisle and come to the front. Confess your faith in Christ before this audience. And we'll baptize you for the remission of your sins. And as you come up out of the waters of baptism, you can be like the Ethiopian unit rejoicing, receiving the forgiveness of sins. If there one tonight that maybe you thought social drinking was okay as long as you didn't get drunk. Maybe you're struggling with this substance. Let the brethren here help you, you come forward tonight and let them pray for you and strengthen you and help you get back on the right track. But whatever your need might be, won't you come tonight while we stand and while we sing.